The Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies presents the Pearl of Great Price Lecture Series, given by Dr. Hugh Nibley. Today's lecture is entitled, The Mountain of the Lord's House. So today, something I've been waiting for eagerly, the first chapter of Moses. <laughs> first chapter of the first book. You notice first of all the significance of that date, June 1830. What does that, what does 1830 signify to us? You knew the church was founded. The church was only three, less than three months old at this time. Now what does June 1830 mean? The month the Book of Mormon was published. This is as old as the Book of Mormon. It's a very significant thing. If you think the reverend Solomon Spalding wrote the Book of Mormon, who wrote the Book of Moses in that case? Uh, the Book of Mormon, we say, would take a good deal of revelation to produce. They say, oh, well, anybody could do that, you know, with a little help. Well, at the same time, he produced a very, very different type of book, which is the Book of Moses. Equally marvelous. Equally wonderful, equally impossible. And we're told here that it's a series of visions. Notice the visions, plural, of Moses. That's the title, as revealed to the prophet Joseph in June 1830. And notice the title comes in here, The Words of God. What a very interesting beginning to have here. Because, uh, uh, which is taken to Moses. Because the words of God, this is a, exactly what the the Egyptian word for scripture, of course, is the words of God. Here's the symbol for God. It comes first, you see. Uh, here's the, the symbol. It's pronounced medu. That's a staff, you see. Medu, netu. Then you have to have a little chicky here to show that it's in the plural. Give it an oo sound. Then you have to have a man. You have to have a man with his hand in his mouth to show that he's speaking. Then you have to have three strokes to show that it's plural. And you put the word God here, netu here, first for honorific transposition. Anything indicate God's always comes first. Actually, it's read this way. It means the words of God. Every sacred Egyptian writing which is in black is in theory the words of God. The red part, the commentary, remember the rubric, that is the commentary of the scribe, the writer, the copyist, any explanation you want to put in, any stage directions or things like that. But the divine words, the wor literally the words that you'll find incidentally, this on the first page of Gardner's Grammar, if you want to see uh, how it's to be rendered, namely the words of God, singular. Not the words of the gods or something, but these are the words of God. And they're written, they're inspired and revealed, the Egyptians believe. And then the other part comes in. We start out here, the words of Moses. These aren't the words of God, which he spake unto Moses at a time when Moses was caught up unto an exceeding high mountain. That's an explanation. The words of God begin, you notice, in the third verse. Behold, I am the Lord God Almighty. All the rest would simply be in red ink. The Egyptians have this very, very easily solved. They write in stereo. You see the human element and you see the divine element in the commentary so that you don't mix them up. It's very convenient to know. And it's very important because it shows us that they're, among other things, that they consider the writing, the divine gift, the gift from heaven and its purpose to preserve the words which were given to the fathers in the beginning by revelation. So that's what we have here, the words of God, and we start reading the we start reading the red print first. And this first verse now we come to the high mountain. Well, I decided this morning to play trivial, I should have been doing something else, to play trivial pursuits with a mountain motif, and it turns out to be not so trivial. A very important thing. First of all, why are mountains important and significant? They they have a great significance, of course, we mentioned the last time up the rest of the earth's crust, the things that begin. But the mountain, of course, is near heaven. But it is also what? Literally near heaven? Well, it's up in the sky. You can say, well, that'd be superstition. But what things can you say literally about a mountain that's literally true? If you wanted to make contact with holier things, now why would the top of a high mountain be an exceedingly high mountain? Remember, the brother of Jared is caught up into an exceedingly mountain, which is called Shelem because of its exceeding height. We'll mention that in a second. But uh, what would be the advantage of being in an exceedingly high mountain? 
You're isolated from the world? It's isolated. It's set apart. It's a pure place. It's not frequented often. You notice that. It is removed. It's private. It's inaccessible. It's undefiled. If any place can be kept holy and undefiled, it would be that, because people don't visit it. Uh, they go up there and leave their beer cans and their lunch remains there. But if it's a very high mountain, they don't. They leave their names and a flag or something like that. But uh, to sort of sanctify the place. It's, it's, it's a holy sort of thing. But this is an advantage to it. But then it also has other particular function. The mountain's looking at Timp right now. What it does, it beckons to us. It commands attention as a reality. Um, remember what Sir Hillary and others have said? Why do you climb the mountains? Because they're there. See, they're, they're there and they're, to use the much overworked, a challenge, a word of a challenge, but they combine this paradoxical element, you see. The mountain is the most visible and conspicuous thing around, and yet it's the most inaccessible. You can see it from a, a longer distance, a greater distance, and from more directions, and from farther away, etc., etc. The mountain's there, it dominates the scene, uh, and uh, yet it's inaccessible. This is a surprising thing, you know, the, the poem, the dialogue, the famous German poem, the dialogue about the the Jungfrau, uh, the Jungfrau was only climbed quite recently, just in this century, you know, uh, because there it was aloof, majestic, and yet everybody could see it, and uh, have you been climbed yet, the Eiger and the Jungfrau carry on a conversation. But, uh, so it is most accessible, yet most visible, so it invites us, it calls our attention. You must realize there are such things. It's a disquieting phenomenon. We, uh, it's, it's unsettling. Uh, and, and it is thrilling, and it invites and it tempts. Now, Petrarch, uh, 1304 to 1374, the first great poet of the Renaissance. The, the Renaissance begins with Petrarch. And to show the type of the Renaissance mind, that he was the typical mind, that he had a new point of view on things, he lived near the foot of the Alps, and uh, he couldn't resist going up to them. Um, he started, he started climbing them and looking around, and he started being thrilled by the sight. And he suddenly real, realized that he shouldn't do that, to be delighted with worldly things, with nature. That was a pagan thing. And he checked himself, he says, and he had to take out his copy of St. Augustine's Confessions and start reading on the spot, lest he be carried away by the beauty of the view. To hear his Renaissance man, modern man, or what will you, uh, he aspires beyond the... Uh, the light of the killer, and St. Augustine is supposed to rescue him from that. But then in the, in the Reformation poems, or Restoration, excuse me, not Reformation, in the Restoration poetry in England, when you have the English garden and everything had to be controlled and gentle and civilized, the lawn and all this, uh, mountains and things regarded as savage, uh, hateful, and an abomination. And the poet Shenstone, the nature, nature poet Shenstone, made himself immortal by calling mountains Earth's dishonor and encumbering load. The, the idea was that the earth was smooth like a lawn and uh, well behaved until man sinned. And then because of the sin, the mountains were afflicted on the earth as, a, as great boils and bumps and unsightly things. And earth's dishonor and encumbering load to punish the earth for the sin when it fell with man, when man fell. So they didn't think of it that way. It's, it's an interesting thing here. Uh, as against the everlasting hills, they didn't believe they were everlasting either. But uh, the mountain is a place of pilgrimage. You notice that pilgrimages are to mountain. Remember Isaiah two and two, right? In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be uh, shall be exalted among the mountains and among the hills and so forth, and all nations shall flow unto it. Uh, it's a place of pilgrimage because it's a place of attraction too. And the temple in Jerusalem was on the Temple Mountain on Mount Moriah, and of course we find all the sacred places are the mountains, and they're very important here, the, uh, as the place of pilgrimage. And the first pilgrims, Christian pilgrims, to go, well, and pagan for that matter, uh, but the first Christian pilgrims to go to, uh, to Palestine to seek the Holy Land, uh, well, mostly in the fourth century. It started out with a, with a Bordeaux pilgrim, and then a lady called Itheria, or Sylvia is her name. She left us a minute account of her travels there. She was a rich Gallic woman. Uh, one of these dynamic, uh, she was hell on wheels, a terrific old gal. She'd sweep <laughs> through, visit all the holy places, and terrify everybody by her majestic, uh, magisterial authority. But the place they went to visit was the top of the Mount of the Ascension. They weren't going to the Holy Sepulchre. 
The goal of the pilgrim was to climb the, to the point, some thought it was the Mount of Olives, and he was taken to the Mount of Olives, to the point where the Lord had last left the earth, and there was a footprint. And there were the Lord's last footprint, and there the pilgrim would go and look up to heaven with yearning for the time. This is where the Lord was to come back, because we know, we tell us in Acts, why stand you looking up into heaven? He'll return in the same way he went up. So they went up and expected him to return. They climbed the mountain to see where the Lord had last been in contact with the human race and where he would make it again. And they did it with great yearning. And of course, this idea of footprints on the mountains is very common. I should have put down here for I forgot. Remember Adam's Mountain in Ceylon, Sri Lanka? The center of the island is this vast sort of a monodnac uh, with, uh, with a footprint on it, the place where Adam uh, Landed, landed when he came to this earth. And it's the, it's the oldest pilgrimage there. Pilgrims come from all over. They cross Adam's Bridge, which was formerly a land bridge from into Ceylon. And then the idea is to climb the mountain and pull yourself up the mountain. And they do it. You can still see pictures in the National Geographic and so forth with uh, chains and ropes and everything else. Originally a hand rail that it had rotted away and they pulled themselves up. And there is an account uh, of the iron rod from Jerusalem that led to the temple. That's grasping the iron rod. Uh, we're told that in the, uh, there used to be, remember before the top of the mountain was leveled off for the temple, the temple was on a much higher, it was much higher, and uh, it was risky. And when it was rainy and stormy, it was spring and people would have to go, it was hard to get up there to, ha to follow the sacred way, the sacred trail up. You can still do that in Athens going up the Acropolis the same way, you know, the sacred trail going up to the top of the mountain. And uh, so they had handrail going up to, to help people, and it was iron, uh, but it uh, rusted away. It was supplanted by wood and brass and other things as far as that goes. But they always used the expression, uh, if for all, old people or weak or when it was dangerous and slippery, to get to the temple you had to, to hang on to the railing, grasp the iron rod, they call it. And so this emerges in the Book of Mormon in a, in a context which, which Joseph Smith couldn't have discovered or anybody in his time. We have these interesting things. Well, anyway, we have the mountain of Ceylon. We'll put that in. It shouldn't have, that's, that's snuck in here. That occurs to me. The, uh, but then you have um, uh, Adam's mouth, because it's Adam is where Adam came to earth and where Adam fell. Well, it's quite a story. The, the Quran tells us the story when Adam fell. He, well, we won't go into that. But what about the guru on his mountain? We, we see the, uh, the cartoons in the New Yorker and so forth, the person who climbs the high mountain to get to the guru. Well, there have been some studies on that. What would make a guru most at home uh, on, a, on a high mountain very uncomfortable and by himself? As you say, he's alone. He's a holy man in his own place. You have to make an effort to reach him and so forth. But for one thing, we're talking about real mountains where gurus are, the Himalayas, where the oxygen becomes very thin at the 10,000 foot elevation. Uh, the rule was in the Air Force, you put on your oxygen mask at just 10,000 feet. Well, that isn't considered very high anymore. But your, your breath comes short on temp before you get to the top there. But the idea is that this thin oxygen and fasting and altitude sickness, that's a very real thing, and exhaustion and cold when you reach them, they produce hallucinations. Of course they do. You get an unworldly feeling. You get carried away by the wind. I know I've no, lots of people would get, the, and when they used to have the big hikes up tip, the people would get mountain sickness, they would get giddy and uh, turn pale and have to sit down and pant and so forth. And uh, this is the best way to have visions, revelations, hallucinations and so forth. And so the guru sits up there breathing this thin oxygen, which isn't enough, you see, to uh, keep you going. And uh, then the story, of course, of the brother of Jared. And this is a very important point in it. Remember, he said he, uh, he talked with the Lord on a, an exceeding high mountain. It was called Shalom because of its exceeding height. Now, Shalom, the original word of Shalom, Shalom, uh, means peace, but it originally meant safe, safety, security, and uh, because it was a high place. The Shalom was a high place. Shalom is still the word for ladder. The Silma, Salma, Shalom, uh, Sulam in Arabic. Uh, it's a very high, a very high elevation is a Shalom. So when it tells us in the book of Ether, uh, in uh, the third chapter, the whole third chapter of the book of Ether is the Lord speaking with Enoch on this mountain, this high mountain called Shalom because of its exceeding height. But he goes up there, remember, he gets the, he, mo he moltens out the stones and the, he gets them all ready, but they won't shine. He knows from the story of Noah that they should shine because Noah had the Zohar in his ark. They were two stones, 
stones that went in the ark of Noah that told him when it was day and night because they would shine. They, they shine by their own light. The story of the Zohar, too. It's a great little long story about that. Uh, and we're told in the book of Ether that they were built after the manner of Noah's Ark. And so when Ether asks the brother of Jared, rather, asks the Lord, uh, what will I do to bring light in the Ark? Because we're going to be dashed under the waves as terrible uh, storms. Uh, house dinner from the, from, the, uh, from the Ice Age storms, the great uh, torrential uh, vast winds and so forth. Remember, 354 days, the wind did never cease to blow. 340 days. Well, anyway, uh, what did we do? Well, he knew what to do. The Lord said to him, well, what would you do? You go fi figure it out for yourself. So, without any further instructions, he went and made these molten stone because we're told that Noah had two fine crystals just like that. Uh, it was clear as glass, and they shined in the dark. He was going to do the same thing, but there was one check. The stones wouldn't shine. And so he was humiliated, and there's marvelous passages where he comes, the most beautiful description of humility and repentance you can find anywhere in literature is the way the brother of Jared uh, addresses the Lord. He is absolutely flat. He is on his face. He is completely humiliated, and the things he says there are quite, are quite thrilling. But the thing is, he climbs the mountain with these stones. He goes back to the top of the mountain, gets as far as he can, to the top, then he holds up the stone and says, this is where I get off, I can't go any further. See, the, the moral being, of course, that you do everything you can, then you ask the Lord to take over. And that's what he does. It says he went to work, he worked exceedingly hard, getting the stones out, molt, <laughs> melting them and so forth. And then he toils up the mountain, he gets to the top, now Lord, this is as far as I go. You must take over. He holds the stones up, and then the Lord comes down and touches them. That's it, and then it knocks him flat on his face again. Uh, all this is, is very dramatic, remarkable stuff, you know. You know Joseph Smith, all this at the age of 24, cooking this up out of nothing, you know. It's quite a thing. Well, uh, then uh, we have, of course, the uh, picture, the Mount of Transfiguration, in Matthew 7 and Mark 9. 7 to Mark 9 and 2. For the Lord is transfigured on an exceeding high mount. And again, remember, Peter was out of his head. Peter was not, remember, let's build three temples, and he knew not what he was saying. And then we're told in Mark that uh, they didn't know what was happening, and the, until they came to themselves, the Lord was shaking their shoulders and saying, wake up, it's all over now. And then they woke up. We won't go into that, but again, you see, it was on the mountain of the Transfiguration, where Moses and Elijah came, and the Father came behind a cloud. Remember, it says he was sheltered by a cloud. Well, high mountain is a place where you'd find a cloud anyway. And then, but there are other mountains now. That's the one sense of mountain, that place of contact, the holy place. But more significant even is that of a, is the Jabal, the Oriel, and so forth. The Arabic word for mountain is Jabal, and the plural is Jabal, and Jabal means range of mountains, of course. It means borders, the regular word for borders, Jabal. The very same thing happens in Greek, is Taurus, is the mountain, Horus is the boundary or chain of mountains or range of mountains. <coughs> It is the natural boundary, of course, the range of mountains and so forth. And it's the same thing we have. Uh, <clears throat> remember, uh, uh, Achilles says, I have no, no quarrel with the Trojans. I didn't want to come on this crazy expedition with you guys. He said, <clears throat> because many <clears throat> ranges of Oriaschiwenta, of shadowy mountains, lie between my land and theirs. They're in another world as far as, uh, as I'm concerned. And so we get the idea for the Oris. I say, if it's, <clears throat> if it's masculine, horus, then it's a boundary, it's a uh, limit, it's a boundary line, it's a, any kind of a fence or boundary. If it's taurus in the neuter, then it's, and with the plural, orea, then it's a mountain, a high mountain. But it's the same word, you notice, as the Hebrew word har, that's the word for mountain, har. Pahoran, <coughs> in Book of Mormon, the Judge Pahoran, it means the Syrian, the mountain man, an Egyptian name. And uh, the same thing, the, uh, the Russian word for mountain, Gora. Gora is a mountain. Gor, hor, gor. Uh, anything is a uh, mountain, sir. <coughs> the Jabal, mountains of both. So it means a range, but it's the limit of your visibility. And in Egyptian, this is very important because. It is the Akkad, it's the boundary between the two worlds. And they all are very extremely common, you notice the names of so many pharaohs, you and everybody. You know, Ikhnatan was, uh, Akhenaten, the famous reformer and so forth, means the solar disk on the mountain. 
Not for nothing. And it's always like this. You see it all over when you go to the to the Ramses exhibit. You'll see it on the mountains, and it's the Akhet. The Akhet, which means the sun on the horizon. You can draw it better than that. There are the mountains, and the two mountains, and then the sun is rising between them. <coughs> and it is uh, very important here. Um, it is, uh, well, I'm going to read you something about it. The, uh, Paul tells us that faith is uh, the uh, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, this is the justification of faith. In the horizon, you have the evidence of things not seen, solid, tangible evidence. It's really there of things that really exist that you can't see and may never see. In fact, you can never see them because they're always beyond the horizon, but they're always there and they're always real. There's a section here in this book, I don't know whether I should take up time with it, but uh, I think it's quite to the point here because it combines, you see, why the Egyptians stuck to this crazy stuff, it seems to us, because it was actually very real. These are real experiences, and of course, with the, if, with the nomad peoples, and I know with the Hopi, it's a very important thing to stand up at the end of the, at the, at the second mesa, there's a cliffs of the second mesa just above the corn rocks in the cemetery there. And it used to be now, back in the 1940s and 50s, they don't do it anymore, it's too bad. Things are getting lost after thousands of years, that all the men and boys of the village would line up along the cliff, right along the edge and face the sun, to see the first point of sun that came over the light, the first day they'd, raise, they'd pray to it. Uh, the first point of sunlight on the horizon. The, uh, now, uh, this is from a Joseph Smith's papyrus, that he might enter the horizon along with his father, Ray, the sun. If the essence of cult and festival is transition, the rite of passage, succession of lives, that's quoting a famous work by Movinkel. See, the rite de passage, you pass from one state of existence to another. That's what we're interested in more than anything else. Transition, the rite of passage, and succession of lives. Now, the great exponent of such meaningful motion is the sun, which rises and sets every day. We, uh, we quoted Catullus on that, you know. Uh, so, occident uh, etredira posent, the sun sets and rises every day and it keeps up, and that's an example, but we unfortunately just can't follow it. Now, the disk is directly observable under normal conditions, only on the horizon. That's when you can see it clearly and so forth. And here the Book of the Dead says, Thou passest over the sky, every face watcheth thee, and thy course, thou thyself, are hidden from their gaze, except when you show yourself at dawn and at eventide. Then they can look at your disk and they can see it. It turns red and then it is, uh, so you can view the sun. Otherwise, you better look through smoke glasses. It's when the sun is on the horizon we get a look at it. The gate of heaven or underworld between the earth and the, and the other world. We're quoting Eric Hornell, a very good authority on this business, Egyptologist. He says, the gate of heaven or the underworld between the earthly and the otherworldly spheres was from the earliest times localized in the achet, and that's this here. That is the seam or juncture, the not stella. It's the, the um, interface. This is actually the interface between the other world and this world. Because the sun has been invisible. It has been in the dark until now. And now it's coming into our particular sphere. And then you, you bid it goodbye. You say, it must go somewhere else. But, and there must be somewhere else for it to go. So why should we think that we have seen everything there is? This is the, the moral. It was from the earliest times in the Akhet, in the east and west, where heaven, earth, and underworld came into contact with each other and where intercourse between the spheres is possible. See, that's what happens. This is where the touching is. In passing the horizon, the sun god and his ship both changed their natures and so forth. The, uh, thus, one begins his journey through the hours of the Stundenwach and the hours of the night, you see, by standing on the threshold, the yidip of the bank of the, or the horizon, which is the door of his house, the middle chamber, the three main rooms and so forth. Uh, the word Akit can designate either that particular spot on the skyline at which first or last brilliant point of the sun's surface is visible, <coughs> these being movable points representing uh, every day, they move along, you know, these being movable points represented by the ancient as a series of gates or windows. You find more about that in the old book of Enoch than anywhere else. Or else it can be the region just below the horizon whose effulgent glory can be seen reflected in, its, in our own upper sky at dawn and twilight. See, before the sun rises, you can see there's a lot of light. It, it must be in some place that's very brilliant down there. And after it sets, it bright, 
It goes into the warm, bright chambers of the West. Where's it gone? There must be something very pretty back there. So you start thinking about that. According to Schott, Siegfried Schott, in the pyramid text, the inhabitants of the Yakut live beyond the mountains of the eastern and western horizons, but this side of the underworld itself, they belong to the place of transition. Uh, well, um, for those who travel, especially in the desert, the horizon is constant and visible proof of realities that may escape the city dweller and the farmer. The horizon at dusk and dawn is not a fade-out place. It's not a dim interregion. It's as sharp as dawn of the razor. It's as sharp, you know, like uh, deer. You can see it against the mountains. It's not something vague. It's something that fades out. But it's there. It's there and very real. And so you want to go up to it and see what's on the other side. Well, there is something there after all. You were right in supposing there was something there, but you've still got a horizon in front of you. You haven't settled it. You, you haven't seen everything yet. You, you don't do away with it, and yet the fact that it moves doesn't mean that it's not real. It's a hard black line as real and intensely visible as anything can be. But when you pick a mark on the horizon and walk up to it, there's no, there's more beyond another horizon. We discover that the horizon, the absolute limit of our vision, it's a real limit, an absolute vision, see 14 miles in the 14, 15 miles, beyond which you cannot see, beyond which for us nothing exists, is only a relative thing after all. The absolute limit of our present visible world turns out to be only the threshold of another world beyond. Farmers and city dwellers unaware and suspicious of what lies beyond the safety oasis and the city walls are prone to existentialist philosophy and take a skeptical and gloomy view. There's nothing beyond, in other words, of what lies beyond the present life. But the nomad of the desert, who's always a pilgrim, you see, he can always believe that there is something beyond because for him there always is something beyond. One of the peculiar traits of Egyptian culture and belief is surprisingly enough an obsession with the idea of eternal progression, another nomad heritage. The saints are thus and the goddess folk, people that are always wandering always been drawn to distant horizons and spurned it, this present world as altogether too confining. The passage from world to world and from horizon to horizon is dramatized in the ordinances of the temple, which itself is called the horizon. The temple itself is the horizon. And uh, is the place where you, where you experiment with these things. Well, so we get this horizon idea. Now, you all know about, uh, oh, incidentally, what if the sun isn't there? This is another interesting thing. <coughs> The word for mountain is, and actually, without, without the, uh, so that it is Jew. And that means danger, unknown territory, stay away, look out for it. Because you, the sun isn't there, the mountain, you see, shuts off a land beyond, which might not be a very safe land, might not be very healthy for you to visit as far as that goes. But uh, <coughs> it means a treacherous, Threatening, dangerous, unknown. It's the word, regular, common word for evil, Jew, threatening thing. Well, now you all know about pyramids and ziggurats, but they're mountains. They're artificial mountains, as you know, and mountain rites take place then. The pyramids are making mountains, and the ziggurats of Babylonia are mountains, specifically places of contact with the worlds above and below. The king, every, every New Year's Eve, would ascend to the top of the ziggurat in Babylon, and there he would cast the dice, 360 possibilities, one for each day of the year, and he would uh, uh, draw the barisma, uh, well, if he was a Persian, he'd do that, and uh, t uh, tell the fortunes, make the divinations for the year. There was a couch, as Geronimus tells us, there was a couch where the king would spend the night uh, with the gods, just that one night, uh, dealing with the matters of the eternities, finding out what the future of his people would be. In fact, there's a good book by Gail Wittengren on that, this doctrine in uh, among the Jews and the Christians, uh, called the uh, the, uh, the sent one in the heavenly book, the messenger, the heavenly, the heavenly book, because the king goes up wherever you go. He goes up to the top of the mountain or the top of the temple, the chamber up there, or the top of the pyramid, <coughs> and comes down with the heavenly book to show that he's been there. Well, um, and so the mountain of the Lord's house is the temple mountain. And the mountain of all, you know, is Sinai. Is Sinai. Now, that's a very dangerous mountain, as you know. It was divided off. There was a, there was a boundary. There was a, they set up a stone wall, a low stone hedge uh, along the bottom uh, of it. And beyond that, any ordinary person, any ordinary Israelite that stepped one inch beyond that would be struck dead. There was a higher wall. Priesthood could go in there. Beyond that, others could go with Moses. Moses went up with, uh, with uh, Joshua. 
But to the top, only Moses could go, and there he talked with the Lord. The mountain was covered with flame by night and with smoke by day, obviously a volcano, and it shook violently when Moses went up. It was very dangerous. Fire came out, rocks fell down, smashed people. It was a volcano. It was an active volcano, and it's very clear, of course, from that, from, uh, from uh, the uh, Exodus, the description of the mountain. And, uh, but there are also steps to heaven. There are various degrees of purity as you go up. A person who is so pure may go so far, another may go so far. There are four different steps here. Finally, Moses can reach to the top and talk to the Lord. And in this, Moses is withdrawn. And we're told here, this particular mountain is a sacred one, and you're not supposed to know about it. Notice the last verse of our first chapter here. To Moses, in the mount, the name of which shall not be known among the children of men. This is, this is Moses and the Lord alone. And then, of course, we have this. 121st Psalm. Excuse me. Uh, el Haharim, El Haharim, Mehim Yavo Esri. I will raise, lift up my eyes to the mountains, we say to the hills. The same word is the word har, harim is the one it uses. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains, the mountains from which cometh my help. The Lord is my help, and of course. Now, uh, this is an interesting thing. Uh, why would the help come from the mountains and so forth? Well, that's explained very well in that, those wonderful verses on Isaiah, which the prophet Abinadi uses so effectively. Isaiah 52 and 7. Why does Abinadi repeat it five times in the book of Mosiah? 12th, chapter 15, verses 15, 16, 17, 18, Moses chapter 12, 21, and so forth. How beautiful upon the mountainside of the feet and then the bare good tidings. Why does, my, does Abinadi keep throwing that at the corrupt priests of, of King Noah here? Um, and it's very interesting, now this, this particular verse of Isaiah, <clears throat> because it, the only time the word Navu occurs, Ma Navu, that's where you get the word Ma Navu word. How beautiful upon the mountainside, and it's how beautiful, Ma, how, Navu. It's the only time it uses the word Navu for beautiful, as for the feet and so forth. Ma Navu al Haharim Ragle Melasher. How beautiful upon the mountainside of the feet of him who brings good tidings. Literally, are the legs of the one, uh, of the runner, Melasher. Basara is the Arabic word to bring the good news. Mabasara is to always to bring good news in the Semitic language. And then, Mashmiak Shalom, and who causes us to hear that there's peace. Good, and who brings us good luck. Mashmiak means causes us to hear. And then he says, Mabasara Tov, and again there's your Basara again, and who is a bringer of what is good. It's double, you see, who brings good tidings of good, it says in our King James Version. It seems redundant that he wants that to be, brings good tidings of good news here, and Mashmiach Yeshua, and causes us to hear about our salvation, our Savior. Same word as Jesus, Yeshua, you see, uh, Josiah or uh, the, uh, Joshua, and tells us about the Savior. Well, you can see what the point is here. Abinadi is announcing that from the other side of the mountain, from the other world, comes the good news. This is revelation. It's the welcome messenger from the other world, the angel who brings us the gospel who brings us the message of salvation, who brings us the message of peace, which you don't find on this side of the mountain, you see. So that's why he repeats how beautiful, how welcome are the feet of the person who brings these. How different are the feet of Apollo rushing down to bring vengeance to a wicked people. <laughs> a famous line from Homer, And his coming was like the coming of night. He smote them because of their wickedness. Well, uh, but this is why, coming from the, this is, he's talking about angels coming from the other side. It's what this is, the feet of those on the mountain who bring good tidings. You come across the mountains, you wait to see if you'll come. Now, Moses, the first chapter of Moses, is a primeval drama. It's an, it's an everyman drama. Another primeval drama, and I, I've never mentioned this connection before, but it certainly should be, is the Prometheus of Aeschylus. Because it's the very same type. It's, this introduces us into a most remarkable setting, a remarkable world. You know what Aeschylus is. He's the earliest, but we forget that the great Greek tragedians, along with Aristophanes, they all lived at the same time. Everybody lived in one little bunch there. It was just one generation produced them. Everything we're living on ever since. But Aeschylus, who lived from 525, the year that 
Persians took Egypt to, this is an, uh, an easy note to remember, 456. To 456, he wrote Prometheus Found. And you notice we have a famous poem in, in English, shall it, shall it Prometheus Found? Prometheus, the word of course means the prophet. Theos, Theos means to see ahead of time. He could see, he could foresee all things. But the Prometheus Found is a marvelous drama. It is the one of the seven that survived of Aeschylus. But it's, it take, doesn't place place on Earth. It has nothing to do with the affairs of cities or human affairs. There are no human characters in it at all. The only one. It's a primeval drama here. Uh, we find the hero in the beginning, as we find Moses here, on a high mountain. Remember, it says the Lord talks to him. When he talks to Moses, it's on the high mountain here. Uh, we find him on a high mountain. And... Uh, He's being crucified because he's the savior of the human race. And uh, it's a long story. He tells us here uh, oh, what's going on. Well, this is the third dispensation that he recalls. Way back in the beginning when there was a council in heaven, uh, way back in the beginning you started out with, uh, um, with Uranus and just the heavens, the starry heaven you see, uh, with Uranus and Gaia and uh, the, the primal parents, and uh, there was a council in heaven among the titans, and uh, Cronus was one of the, Cronus consulted with his five brother titans, and uh, he decided to overthrow his father and take the rule, because he was a, thought he was an important person, so he rebelled. You know, the, the rebellion of Cronus against Uranus. Now, you'll notice strange echoes of things in here. They're all mixed up, and they're supposed to be. And uh, so, as a result of that, he uh, is punished. They bind him in Tartarus. He is bound in Tartarus. Ah, but one of the Titans, one of the brother Titans, is a very clever man, and that's the name of Zeus. Well, not Uranus here. And that, of course, is Zeus. With the aid and counsel and advice of Zeus, he managed to escape. He's freed. He's liberated again and takes the throne. And he's jealous and he doesn't want anyone to succeed him, so he eats up all his male children, you see, so he won't have any successor on the throne. He's very jealous. But his wife, Rhea, who's the moon, uh, plays a trick on him. He thinks he's eating three of his children, and she gives him three big rocks, which he swallows. <laughs> and they, thereby she saves the life of Zeus and of, uh, and of Poseidon see, and of Pluto, or of Plutus. So uh, uh, Zeus is saved. And uh, Cronus is overthrown, and Zeus now becomes the king. Another succession, another overthrow, another council in heaven. How did Zeus do that? He did it with the help of Prometheus, Prometheus the wise. Prometheus was one of the counselors in the council of heaven, and he told him how he could overthrow Cronus and rule. And Zeus did. And Zeus overthrew Prometheus and decided, then they decided on the creation of the world. And uh, he didn't like, uh, Zeus didn't like, had contempt for the human race. Uh, they're weak, they're unable to survive, they're unfit to survive, they're, they're poor creatures, they're miserable, they don't deserve to survive. And he planned to let them just die out. But Prometheus would none of that. Uh, the great Prometheus, he made possible their survival by stealing fire. He gave them fire. He didn't steal it, he gave them fire, so they were able to survive. This infuriated Zeus, and by puni for punishing, to punish him, he is... Pasolos, it starts out in the opening scene, he's being crucified, he's being nailed to the rock. Well, either the chains are his, but the, the torture goes along with it because the, the famous eagle that preys on his liver as he's tied up there, which is not a comfortable situation. Uh, uh, it's, uh, he's going through this torture, and in this position, the, the play opens, you see, and it's on the highest and remotest mountain in the world, in the Caucasus, on the top of the Caucasus. Again, it sounds like our Book of Moses, only a very different sort of thing here. Well, uh, We've been talking about earlier dispensations. You got this thing? And the Prometheus drama, you'll notice here, just from what I've said, is full of scrambled motifs, especially suggesting the Book of Enoch. Well, where did Aeschylus get all these ideas? For one thing, his gross insult to Zeus. See, <coughs> Prometheus says, look, I've already seen three tyrants fall. Uh, I've already seen, yes, two tyrants fall, Uranus and Cronus, and the third, uh, the third dispensation is going to be the shortest and the, more, and the evilest, and it's going to fall the worst, he says. He predicts that Zeus is going to fall, you see. 
Now here, this is Zeus, the God of the high heavens, the most high God. How can you get away with this in a religious celebration, in a sacred drama, and put Zeus in that light? This sort of thing, isn't it? Well, this wouldn't have been tolerated if it wasn't a bona fide tradition, of course. When he says he's seen two destructions of the wicked, and, and he prophesies a third coming up, and this is going to be, this is the least glorious and the most calamitous of all the dispensations so far, and he says it's going to fall too. Now, what's his position going to be? Then he promises, he, he predicts that a savior is going to come and to save the human race and so forth. And we go into all these motifs, they're all sort of mixed up here, you see. Well now, Aeschylus, who's a very pious man, <coughs> takes liberties in telling the story. Of course he does. Yet he means to convey a true account of man's condition. This is what he's talking about. Because traditions have become tangled up and broken up, we recognize them all over the place here, he must necessarily uh, recompose or restructure, put together the elements in a way that makes the best sense to him. And he's at perfect liberty to do so. There have been some interesting writings recently on the way the Egyptians did the very same thing. Uh, anything that will convey the story in its most clear way. You get together the scraps, you take your turn presenting. You see, all the great dramatists show great liberty, and yet they deal with absolute established and fixed scenes. Everything is prescribed, but if you stay pious and want to explain things, you are justified in putting it in, in different lights. And, and, and uh, in other words, what we have here is this, uh, he recomposes the elements in the most meaningful way to teach us the lesson, and this is what we call a myth. Is the myth bad? Is the Book of Mormon a myth? No, it is not. It is history. Uh, is, uh, are, the, uh, are the parables of Jesus myths? Well, they really took place. These things really could take place. But the one he's talking about, uh, you say, a certain man did so and so. Well, it's perfectly plausible. People do that all the time. Say, the, the lost penny. Wife lost a penny and looked all over the house to find it, desperately to find a penny, or the lost sheep. Well, this happens hundreds of times. There's no doubt that such things happen. Am I talking about a particular thing? Well, when we get to this, like the Book of Mormon or the Pearl of Great Price, it's different from it because it names names and sets dates. It's a different sort of thing. It could have been myth and been quite healthy, too. A few years ago, they used to talk a lot about mythopoeic thing. My old professor Wilson used to talk about that. They thought there was a bright idea. They got it in the 40s and 50s. Uh, myth of poi. That is, thinking that makes up myths to, to explain the world and all that's in it. They call it mythopoeic thinking. And that's what Henry Frankfurt calls it. John Wilson calls it myth-making mentality. It's a myth-making mentality. Today, no one, no one takes that seriously anymore, as Horning and others have shown us. Uh, Mythopoeic is not a way of thinking, but simply a way of telling a story. You don't think that way, you tell the story. Um, it's an interesting thing, you know, in the Middle Ages, speaking about these pilgrims, uh, among the relics they went to see were the various uh, things told about in the parables. They would, on display was the original penny that the woman was looking for and so forth, and they would have all these things like that. The, uh, of course, there was the inn where the man stayed, and they, uh, they would show you his bandages and all the rest. Uh, they, wa they made it very real. It could have been, you see, as far as that goes, but it wasn't a way of thinking, as I say. It was a way of telling the story. So the myth maker says, this is the way I tell the story to make it as clear as possible. In the Book of Moses, we find an astonishing wealth of these mythological motifs. A tremendous wealth. You'd be surprised. I think you can list them well over a hundred. Uh, major myths in there. The details that turn up in the oldest traditions of the race, and they're scattered all through him. And then we find them scattered here and there in various plots and combinations in the mythology of all nations. We have the collection over in the library. It's on reference. You can see it any time. You see, there are all kinds of myths, and they all deal with the same sort of thing. This is a thing that came out, you see, with, with the patternism of the Cambridge School and so forth, when uh, beginning with, uh, with the Golden Bough, uh, Sir James Fraser was able to show that the, you do not find an infinite number of myths and legends and, and practices throughout the world. You just find a few, just a few standard ones. Well, I mean by a few, I mean not an infinite number, but they're always the same. You always run into the same things everywhere else. You always keep saying, well, this is where I came in. But in the book of Moses, we find neatly and consequently arranged. They're really to put together. Here they tell a straight story. <coughs> this is as near as you'll ever get to the original story. There was an original. 
we remember, as I've said before, in the case of parables, that all history deals with characteristic and repeated events. All history is a parable. Just as poetry deals with a very small number of set themes, and as Dr. Johnson showed, there are only so many plots you can have to a story. There's a limited number of plots possible. <coughs> or if you get the new comedy, say, of uh, Plotus and Menander, or uh, Menander, Plotus and Terence, the Romans take it over from the Greeks, uh, with a number, a set number of characters, you have the number of characters prescribed, and with those particular characters, only certain things can take place. So you have only a limited number of prescribed plots, which have to be have to be followed out. And this is, uh, this is the way it is in, in this life. So, but Al Albright pointed out in the Christian century, one of the last things he wrote, uh, that Mormonism is the only historical religion in the world today of our time. Uh, originally, he points out, Christianity and Judaism were historical. I believe when they talk about Moses and Abraham and tell the stories of the wandering of Israel or whatever it might be, or when they tell the stories of the Lords and the Apostles and the Acts, these are histories. These took place in times and events. The first chapter of Luke, the angel came to in the temple on a certain day, stood in a particular place, said certain things to a man, tells us who his wife was, who his family were, the people waiting outside. He goes and visits Mary, tells us where she lived, the street, the city, the town, and the room, there she was. All that goes, It's historical. But Christianity and Judaism, as we've mentioned again and again and again so far, spent the whole time, say, wasted the whole semester trying to make that one thing clear that the Christian world and the Jewish world and the rest of them reject that. The literalism we don't accept. We have to have that here. And that's what's so marvelous about the Book of Mormon. It's going to be really here. These things really happen. Well, the whole Book of Mormon, uh, Book of Moses, comes across as a message from the archaic world. Some of the chapters, especially 6 and 7, are written in a totally different language. It's a poetry you will not find in the Book of Mormon or Doctrine and Covenants or anywhere else. It's a... Uh, it's nature poetry, some gorgeously beautiful passages, but it's very characteristic of the archaic world. Uh, this peculiar idiom, say quite different from that of the Book of Mormon, remember, appearing in the same month as the Book of Mormon came from the press. These passages are rich in metaphor. And then, now here you're going to have metaphors. Well, why do the heavens weep and set forth their tears uh, as, do, as rain upon the mountains? Uh, there's a nice balance to it, beautiful passages there, and so forth. Uh, and the, the voice of the beast was heard out of the wilderness, the rivers were turned from their courses, and so forth. It goes into these, uh, it, there's an extravagance about it, a lushness about it. It goes back to days that now we know correspond to days of geological extravagance. Remember, in the early days, when I went to school, things didn't happen that way. They happened slowly. Nothing was picturesque. Nothing could happen fast. Nothing could happen dramatic. Well, if there's anything I learned about the war, is that it's unbelievably dramatic and picturesque. I mean, it's... Hollywood can't even begin to approach what really happened, so it's an astonishing thing. Now, yep, now here. The first chapter is structured as a drama. And a good one. The simplest, directest way of carrying us back to time, in time, and placing us in a situation. Strange and distant situation that should be very hard to grasp if it weren't placed... In this most elementary and simple thing, it's given to us as if it were a play. Moses' commentaries on the words of God together make a perfect presentation of the primary theme of the drama. <clears throat> it's the primary theme of drama, theology, philosophy, and science, namely, la condition humaine, man's condition in the world. What is the human condition? And that's what we have here. Uh, there have been other plays like it, most famous, of course, you'd say, was, or mystery plays, or the... Uh, or the, uh, the Everyman, the, the old English play Everyman. Now, uh, the time is up now, so we'll, we'll begin with this. We'll begin with the first chapter of Moses the next time, <laughs> unless I think of something else to interrupt me. <laughs>